Top Cut. Hello, everybody, and welcome into today's episode of the Top Cut Yu Gi Oh! podcast. My name is Sunny. I am here with my co host, Caleb. Woo! And of course, before we get too far in, we want to take just a moment to thank the wonderful patrons. So, a huge thank you to Cam Yang, Austin Johnson, Kane Martin, HZH, Cyber, Marshawn Jones, Witchcraft Remain 2022, Zyphorus, Zephyrus, AD, Aaron Gardner, Anthony Lila, Blackwing, Silverwind, The Ascendant is a floodgate. I think you're wrong, but okay. Branded Fart, Brandon, Cult of the Eldritch Gummy Bear, Damien Zinc, Dank Nugs, Invoked Fart, Mountain Man, Nico Gal Number One, Bottom Text, Oatmeal Spaghetti, Owen Alvarado, Pig, Rudolph, Sneaky Links, Sunny You Stubbornness, and it was super effective. Unbanned Number 95, Konami, Virtually Savior's World, What Does Pot Agree Do, Zingus Khan, Aluber the Goober, Get Kaiju Loser, Maxi Solves Combo, Nordic Best Deck, Old Man Red, Pin Code 143. <laughs> okay. Ray Powell, Shockmaster did nothing wrong, and Slake ended up. Thank you all so much for your continued support of the podcast. And of course, we do want to thank our wonderful sponsor, Dragon Shield, for sponsoring the podcast. So, I don't know if you can hear that wonderful shuffling noise or the wonderful hand shuffle sound (laughs) that you get from wonderful Dragon Shield sleeves. They do a superb job of protecting the cards that you're playing with. I use them on all of my decks just about. And of course, you can also get your clear matte over sleeves, your perfect fit under sleeves to really go the extra mile on protecting the cards that, let's be honest, we spend a lot of money on. Oh yeah, what are Barons now, 140? 130, 140, somewhere in that range, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's something you kind of want to double sleeve. I keep my extra deck double sleeved, I know that. So, if you are interested in some Dragon Shield products, be sure to check out their affiliate link in the description down below, as well as, of course, the affiliate link to our TCG Player uh, affiliate that we are... (laughs) Let me rephrase that. Also, check out our TCG Player affiliate link in the description down below. Of course, you can all find that and it helps the podcast at no extra cost to you. If you're on Apple or Spotify, of course, be sure to go in and leave a five star rating if you think that this helps you out at all. Uh, I do believe that we actually got a new review over on Apple Podcasts. We do have a new review on Apple Podcasts. And uh, of course, this review comes in from Blade the Savage. Five stars, a cut above the rest. (laughs) Definitely my favorite place to get my Yu-Gi-Oh! content. Listening to these guys has helped me so much getting back into the game. I can say for a fact, if it hadn't been for the Top Cut Podcast, I wouldn't have built a deck and started going to my locals. Thanks, guys. You are absolutely welcome. I love, love hearing stories like that. I love seeing people leave those awesome comments and those awesome reviews. So, again, if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, be sure to go ahead, leave that little review or that little rating. Just helps us out so much. Uh, I mean, if when you're looking for a new podcast and you click on that and you look and if you see a bunch of terrible ratings, I mean, you're not going to want to you're not no, going to want to listen to that. Definitely not. So and of course, check us out on Twitter. And if you're on YouTube, because we are we are doing more stuff on YouTube now. Please be sure to give us a subscribe, a like, whatever. If you like the content, you can wait till the end. We wait till later on the show. You know, let us earn that subscription, but be sure to check it out. And if you're on Apple or Spotify, feel free to hop on over to the YouTube and drop us a subscribe there because we are trying to get our numbers up. So, all right, that's enough shameless plugging for now. (laughs) So. Why don't we go ahead and get straight on into the absolute meat of today's episode. So we know that there is a lot of confusion in this Yu-Gi-Oh card game. It's not an easy game to understand, and it's not really something that comes very intuitively. A lot of the things that we have in Yu-Gi-Oh are were put there a long time ago, and as and they're not really explained clearly in like even in the rule book oh no which is now what 50 something pages long (laughs) right it's like 50 or 60 something pages when i first got 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 the very first rule book they released it was like 12 pages long yeah i mean it was just so right it, it was just so much less complicated because there were so many different so many so fewer i don't know how to say it there were a lot less kinds of effects and cards and things yeah yeah and there's a lot less stuff they had to explain how it works right absolutely so 
like I think the most complicated thing they had to explain was how fusion summoning worked. Or ritual summons or whatever, but Well the thing about ritual summons is that like how to conduct them is written on the cards. Right. But even so, you didn't have things like problem solving card text to help you understand what the cards did. Oh my god, before that there was a reasonable argument for dark for a dark hole targeting. Yeah, Dark Hole, I mean, it was a weird time in the game's history, okay? I mean, it, it was so bad that you literally had to take your time to go into the... You had to go to a Pojo page and see and look up which cards targeted and which cards didn't. That, that was how, like, this card can't be targeted by your opponent's card effects. Okay, well, which card effects target? This one says select. Does I, This one says choose. What's the what's the difference? The difference is is that sometimes select was targeting, sometimes choose was targeting, sometimes they weren't. Right. You literally had to go look up. Like I said, there was a Pojo page, and it was a list of every card in the Yu-Gi-Oh card game that did or did not target. Yep. So you literally all you had to do was just kind of go into the individual list, and then just couldn't control F name of card. Now on this list, it's got to be on the other list. Right. Yeah. It, it's it's crazy how far we've come in defining the ways that these cards work and yet there's still so many questions yeah uh so problem solving card text was where they kind of started uh what's what i'm looking for like codifying this is what this effect does and using the same wording over and over again to make it easier to understand right for instance they start uh, in about 2014 is when they started actively saying this card does target by 2011 writing. yeah 2011 thank you yeah so the first problem solving card text printed cards were released on july the 8th of 2011 and from then onward everything released has problem solving card text. yeah and then of course over the years they've added to it they revamped it uh 2014 is when they added piercing i think excavation excavation thank you because we talked about it earlier today yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's why the number, we, yeah. we did hours of research for this and we're yeah. still a little yeah yeah a little a little yeah, little, yeah. That's why 2014 is in my head, yeah. So that's when they added Excavate. Right before then is when they added Piercing. So before then, uh, if a monster did Piercing Battle Damage, it literally said if this if this monster attacks a defense position monster and inflict damage to your opponent equal to equal to the difference between uh, your attacking monster's attack and your and your uh, opponent's defending monster's defense. Right, right. Which nearly doubled the length of all the card effects with that. Right. Yeah, there there's a lot of this is mostly this is actually most notable by the way and board the spear <laughs> battles of legend lights revenge is when they added piercing okay cool that's very late yeah yeah that's like 2018 2019 yeah but like yeah no because like i remember looking at board the spear before and after and being like wow yeah because <laughs> he has a bunch of other effects that do other stuff too right so just a little bit of a disclaimer here. We're not experts. No. We're, we're getting there. I don't know. I don't know about that. But I would say if there's anything that we talk about that is unclear in this episode, be sure to reach out to someone that you know and ask for a little bit of clarification. Because what we're going to do today is give you a full primer on problem solving card text how to break down these card effects and how to understand what is really going on when these effects are going off when these effects are activating and what's happening right yeah yeah well like i don't like it to kind of help people kind of get the gist on what the card is saying whatever it says stuff like when this card is activated semicolon blah 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 Right, because a lot of times when we're reading off card effects, we'll mention, well, this is a colon or this is a semicolon. Yeah, this is what we mean by that. We're right. going to kind of explain what we mean by, well, this is a colon, this is a semicolon. Well, we'll have to wait to see if it's a colon or a semicolon. When are they translated from the OCG to the TCG? Right, right. And it sounds trivial, right? It sounds me menial, whether it's a colon or a semicolon or whether or not there's a semicolon at all. But it matters. <laughs> yeah, I was... Me and Caleb were talking actually over a Discord call and we were going over a particular card and my wife happened to be sitting in the room. And she doesn't play Yu-Gi-Oh at all, so she doesn't quite like get it as far as like the importance there. But we're talking and I say, "Oh yeah, and this this is a colon here. That that's really important." And she looked up at me like I was a crazy person. 
but it really does make a difference. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No. But, oh yeah. No. Particularly uh, whenever. Well, 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 you know, we'll get. Well, I was about to say we'll get into that very quickly. So let's just get right on into it, shall we? Sure. So the first thing we're going to define here, and the first thing we're going to talk about is that there are a bunch of different types of effects in the Yu-Gi-Oh card game. So, and also understanding what the different type effects are, how they function, can kind of help you. Can kind of help you create mental shortcuts in your head. Right. So the big ones to know are ignition, trigger, continuous, and quick. Those, those are the four big ones that you need to really understand to understand kind of how these effects play off of each other. Now there are two subcategories that are do kind of come up very rarely flip and then there's just a big old gigantic section called uncategorized which are weird effects that just don't kind of fit in with the others yeah we'll get into those here in a minute yeah yeah let's start off with ignition this is one of the most basic and common kinds of monster effects you see this all the time and we're going to try to give examples for everything that we talk about here but the big thing to understand about these examples that we're going to give is we try to keep it meta relevant but um we end up just listing a bunch of cards in our own decks that we're playing right now so get ready <laughs> yeah to be fair that's also part of that is because they're what we're playing right now so they're the cards that are just most immediate in our heads right so a good example of an ignition effect would be sword soul of taie so sword soul of taie says you can banish one Sword Soul card or Worm monster from your graveyard. Semicolon. Special summon a Sword Soul token. So, what's it, important to note here is that there's it, it doesn't say when this do that, when this happens do that, when this card is a normal summon, uh, when your opponent does anything. Right. So this is an effect that you can just activate in an open game state while this card is on the field. Yes. So if I just normal summon Sword Soul of Taya. I wait for a response from my opponent. If they have no response, then we re-enter an open game state and um, I can declare Taya's effect. Something else you could also very well do here is activate like a spell card from his hand. Resolve the spell card and then go, cool, effect of Taya. Correct. So it doesn't really have to happen immediately on summon. Mm -hmm. You can activate this at any point while this card is on the field as long as you can... As long as there's an open game state. Right. Which is that there is no chain currently resolving. Right. So it's kind of... Let, let's compare this with the next one, which is trigger. So if for an example of a trigger effect, we can look at Sword Soul of Moyi. If this card is normal or special summoned, colon, you can reveal one Sword Soul card or a worm monster in your hand, semicolon, special summon a Sword Soul token. So a big thing to note there is if this card is summoned right so the if this card is summoned and then a colon so this indicates the colon here is very important a colon indicates everything before the colon is activation condition so you'll see these on trigger <sighs> effects pretty much mostly on, always on trigger effects a lot of trap cards have them too yes so the the activation condition is pretty much defined as what you, the conditions that have to be fulfilled for this effect to activate. And when those conditions are filled, then the effect triggers, for right? You, for all you people who remember the show, the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime from when you were kids, um, if you remember Mirror Force, it's tr the, the trigger condition to activate the trap card Mirror Force is your opponent declares an attack. Yes. That's a, that's an old Yugi Boomer uh, example of something like that. Uh, from So, you know, triggers can be a lot of things. They could be your opponent activating card or effect. They could be the summon of the monster when your opponent uh, declares an attack. Right. But the important thing to know here is that that trigger condition happening there means that that is when the effect can happen yes so the diff big difference here between the trigger effects and the ignition effects would be if i normal summon sword soul of mo yi i can activate that effect there or i cannot activate that effect there 
But if I choose not to activate that effect there, I can't just go back and say, oh, and I want to activate my Mo Yi because he was normal. I, I can't do that. Yes, it has to be right then and there. Right, it has to happen when that condition is met. Now, if I don't activate the effect, and let's say I use him and goes to my graveyard and I summon him back with Monster Reborn. Now, his condition was met again. I can trigger that effect again. Mm -hmm. Or I can trigger that effect for the first time. Yeah, in this situation, it'd be the first time. Right. Now, he is once per turn, so I can't do it multiple times in a turn. No matter how many times you... Oh, I wish I could. That would be great. Oh, my God. But, no. I... Sword Soul of Mo Yi, when you meet that trigger, you can do it or you can not do it. But you can't do it again. You can't, like, choose to do it until you his condition for activation is met again. Yeah. Whereas with Taya, I can normal summon Taya. I can do something else and do perform other actions yeah, yeah. and like even a s attack with it right and then at any point in an open game state i can just activate taya's effect <coughs> due to using its ignition effect yes. right so it's think about it like this ignition effects they ignite right mm -hmm. they start the chain yeah, yeah. they start their their own activation whereas a trigger something has to trigger the effect going off like you trigger a trap yeah yeah you know something has to cause that effect to actually go off there has to be something something out some kind of game mechanic making this happen yeah oh for a lot of monsters it's because it was summoned um other monsters trigger effects trigger because your opponent did something right right uh, those are usually negates of some kind or a trap card right so another example for something that is an ignition effect is sword soul strategist long yon right and it reads very different from taya but it's still an ignition effect. You can discard one other Sword Soul card or Worm Monster, semicolon, special summon this card from your hand, then you can special summon one Sword Soul token. So, basically, it is still an ignition effect, right? It's still an effect that you decide to activate when you want to, but it activates from the hand. And you'll see the difference between an ignition effect that happens on the field versus one that happens in the hand or the graveyard because it'll say it'll 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 read in a way to where you can only do it from that place yes so um, you can discard one other card or sorts of worm special summon this card from your hand right yeah it, it'll say what where it needs to be when that effect is that yeah to um another example of that specific thing is actually uh plague spreader zombie mm -hmm. which is uh you uh, take a card from your hand, put it at the top of your deck, and then you special summon it out of your graveyard. Yeah, it says if this card is in your graveyard, colon, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the activation condition. You can place one card from your hand on the top of your deck, semicolon. So there's your cost. Special summon this card with banishment when it leaves the field. So maybe we should also talk a little bit right here about costing versus condition. Uh, well, let's get through all the oh, okay. all the rest of the effects. So a subcategory on trigger, though, is flip. You're not going to see it very often. Especially um, not in today's metagame. Um, the, the only like the only meta rival and example that we could give was Subterra Guru and maybe the Shadals. Uh, the key thing to note about flip monsters is that their effects activate when they're flip face up. Right. And it even says, as part of the monster type, that it is a flip monster. Uh, Subterra Guru straight up says that it's a dragon flip effect monster. Correct. And it says flip with a colon, right? Activation so, condition. Correct. You can add one subterra card from your deck to your hand, except subterra guru. Pretty clear cut, but it's important to note that there is a difference there. Yes, because there are other cards whose effects activate when they're whose effects trigger when they're flip face up. Those are different from flip effect monsters. Flip effect monsters can also trigger when they're attacked and they get flip face up. Right. So. A key difference here would be something like Deslacuda, right? You think about this when you think of the Pac-Man strategy from yeah. Goat Format. Deslacuda says when this card is flipped face up, draw one card, right? But that's an act that's an activation condition, which isn't fulfilled in the damage step. Is that right? Is that how that works? Uh, I that sounds correct. Yes. Okay, so if I'm wrong about that, uh, I don't know Goat Format rulings. I don't know if that's why yeah. that works the way it works. Yeah. But but the but, point is, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, because it does not say flip, it does not work. Yeah. Because then it'd be broken. Yeah. <laughs> so next we have continuous effects. So continuous effects, they 
they're a little bit more than they seem on the surface but the long story short is this is effect this is an effect that is continuously applying while this monster is face up on the field so you will usually see this in conjunction with floodgates Herald and I do Arc. not say this yeah. lightly. Uh, the a great example for that is Herald of the Ark Light. Yeah, an actual floodgate monster. Yes. Who knew? Uh, ba- th- in my opinion, that's part of a floodgate. It has to be a continuous effect that's being applied. I mean, me too. Even even to, even if it's just the end of the turn, it is a continuous effect. But a large portion of our Discord server would disagree on what a floodgate is. Anyway, I think it's just a meme at this point. Anyway, back back to okay. So Herald- I don't know that it is. I think they're serious. Okay. So there, all the arc light is all cards. Any monster sent monster from hand right. or main deck to the graveyard is banished and set. Boom. End of sentence. No colons. No semicolons. That's just while it's on the field. That effect is applying. Now, though, now those effects can be anything as as simple as just. All dragon type monsters gain a hundred attack, right? It, or something as complicated as this, right? It, they could be very innocuous, or they could be very have a huge effect on the game state. Yes. So the the uh, the next one we want to talk about is quick effects. So a good way to think about quick effects is they say quick effect. That's the yeah. best way to identify them. Yeah, like they literally say parentheses quick effect there's a so so like if there's a condition that you have to meet for the effect can trigger it'll say meet the it'll say the condition that it has to meet first and then literally parentheses quick effect colon right so a good way to think about quick effects is quick effects can be chained they're chainable so that means that these can be activated in at spell speed two so a good example, like we said, is Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit. Ash Blossom Joy Spring also applies here. Right, but we use that one a lot, so... Yeah, yeah, so we're, we're kind of... Dancing go- around it. Yeah, kind of using uh, Ghost Ogre for this one. So, Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit reads, During either player's turn, when a monster card on the field activates its effect, or when a spell trap card that is already face up on the field activates its effect, quick effect... Okay, so, and then a colon. So, the way you break this down is, everything before that colon is its activation condition. So, you can activate this card when that monster face up on the field activates its effect, or a spell trap that is already face up activates its effect, right? So, you can activate Ghost Ogre. So, let's say your opponent has Appaloosa face up, and they activate Appaloosa on the field. You can chain Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit to Appaloosa. Because these are quick effects, they are chainable. So that's a pretty important thing to note. Another example of a quick effect monster who does, who actually, in fact, does not have a specific trigger condition. DD Crow. Yes, that is a it, great example. It literally says in in parentheses, quick effect colon. Right. That's the activation condition. It's just spell speed two. You can activate in response to anything, or you can activate it in an open game state. Uh, yep. Discard this card the graveyard, then uh, target one card in your opponent's graveyard, banish it. Right, so quick effects are pretty powerful as a general rule of thumb. Mm-hmm. I would say that they might, as a, they might be the most powerful of these, but a lot of times they're put on restrictions. They're put on certain cards within certain archetypes. They're, yeah, they're put on a lot of. They put a lot of emphasis on making sure that they're summoned or used a particular way, such as like Sword Soul Grandmaster Chi Zhao. Um, quick effect you can banish one sword soul crawler worm from your graveyard then target one other effect monster field negate its effects until the end of this turn so when you look at the caliber of quick effects destroying cards in your opponent's field negating Negating, monsters banishing uh, someone out of the graveyard yeah a lot of times they're really they're really they're attached to a powerful effect yeah and that's part of being spell speed too but that makes them usually a little bit rarer right oh yeah uh, yeah there's actually not like compared to ignition continuous and trigger even flip they're i think the rarest uh type uh they're probably rarer they're probably rare the flips are probably rarer than quick effects these yeah. days but it, quick effects are not the most common most of what you see is actually trigger effects and ignition effects now the actual text quick effect was introduced in 2017 right so before then the easiest way to denote that something was a quick effect 
was if it said uh, during either player's turn. A good example of this would be Miscellanosaurus. <laughs> Old yeah. printings of Miscellanosaurus do not actually say quick effect. New printings of Miscellanosaurus. No, never mind. They do. No, old printings don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, wait, new ones don't either. No, no they do. Uh, so the original printing of Miscellanosaurus just says during either player's main phase. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so that'd be the common, the original common printing. Uh, right. Then the reprint gold literally says quick effect. Right, right. Um, so it says during the main phase, quick effect. Right, and it frees up a lot of text in the box. Yeah, too. yeah, because now they don't have to say during either player's main phase. It's just during the main phase, quick effect. Right. So, and then there are there is an unclassified or uncategorized, but it's, section. It's literally every every other effect that doesn't fit into any of those categories. So yeah, some examples of this would be a lot of people call them replacement effects. Yeah. Um, so if you look at like Sword Soul uh, Supreme Sovereign Cheng Ying. It says, if this card would be destroyed by card effect, you can banish one card from your graveyard instead. There's no colon, there's no semicolon. So there's it, no activation condition, yeah. there's no cost. So it's not an activated effect. It, it's just a thing that happens. Right, but it's also not really continuous either. It's just a thing. Yeah. Um, now, it is an effect, not a condition. We'll get into that later. So it, so if you, so if you imperm or droplet the... Uh, Ching Ying, it, 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 it can't do it. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, another another great example of a unclassified effect is actually uh, in Salamangrates, the Salamangrate Sanctuary. Right. Uh, its ability to perform the reincarnation link sum, and that's where um, it changes the way all your Salamangrate leap monsters work, in that it, uh, they have their normal materials or uh, a copy of itself. Correct. Um, so, you can use Sunlight Wolf into Sunlight Wolf. Instead and, of two or more Sal uh, Cybers monsters. Right. So it allows you... It changes the rules of the game for you, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, so... But not all unclassifieds are quite that powerful. It's just... Some are as dumb as... Uh, I'm trying to think of like a really dumb one. Well, we didn't put that much prep into it. Yeah, yeah. But like some like some of them are kind of are kind of weird. Oh, like... um. Ad uh, Adagio, an old old card who I don't even know what card you're referencing. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember what it does, but it, it had a weird effect that, like, like even back then, people were like, "What does this thing do?" Yeah. So the next thing we're going to talk about is activation versus like an activated effect versus a not activated effect, or something like that, and what how you denote activation condition versus cost. So we've already talked about this a little bit, but just for the sake of brevity and for the sake of really completeness right really explaining all of it so there are activated effects and not activated effects so an activated effect will always have either a colon or a semicolon indicating that the effect activates and starts a chain so a good example like i like we've said are sword soul of mo yi sword soul of taya these effects activate and they start a chain. But a good example of an effect that does not activate or does not start a chain would be Incredible Ecclesia the Virtuous. So she says, if your opponent controls more monsters than you do, you can special summon this card from your hand. Yes, that is, what is that, a semicolon? There's nothing. There's okay, it's just yeah. a comma. Okay, in that case, that would just be a summon condition. Right, so if, if your opponent controls more monsters than you do, comma, you can special summon this card from your hand, period. So the thing about that is it's not an activated effect. It doesn't have any colon. It doesn't have any semicolon. So essentially, this summon does not start a chain. Yes. So the way that you can think about this is summons that don't start a chain, they happen inherently. And I know that that's a term that most people don't want to use, especially when they're trying to explain something to somebody yeah. that's kind of newer at the game. I, I know that the term inherent summon is, <clears throat> well, inherently looked down upon. Yeah. But, but for the sake of discussion, it really does. It flows a lot better than a summon that does not start a chain. Yeah. Like the best way I know how to describe it to somebody who's new is kind of like how normal summons don't start a chain. Right. It's just normal summon 
response window. Do you have anything active in response to negate the normal summon? No. Cool. Do you have anything activate in response to the summon itself? To the summon itself, such as a quick effect. In resolution of the summon. Yeah, in resolution. At that point, the monster's already been successfully summoned. Summon triggers pop off. It would go on the chain first. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, that's basically, basically what it's saying is you can conduct a special summon the same way you would a normal summon or you just put it on the board. Right. It's something that happens inherently within the actual mechanics of the game. Yeah. It doesn't activate. It doesn't start a chain. It just happens. Yeah. When the conditions are met. Correct. So, but if there's a colon or a semicolon, that indicates that it is an effect that activates. So if you look at Sword Soul of Moyi, it has both a colon and a semicolon. Now, what does this mean? Well, the colon indicates that the there, there are conditions to this activating. For example, Moyi says when this card is normal or special summon. That's the condition for activation. So most of the time you'll see these colons like this on trigger effect monsters because they have to have a condition to trigger their effects. Exactly. So the colon is to anything for the call to denote the trigger for the effect. Or the activation condition. Yeah. Then you have a semicolon. Now everything before the semicolon indicates cost. So when looking at Sword Soul of Mo Yi, it says... If this card is normal or special summoned, colon. Okay, well, that's activation condition. You can reveal one Sword Soul card or worm monster in your hand. Semicolon. Special summon a Sword Soul token. So, in, for sequencing purposes, right? You go, normal summon Sword Soul of Moyi, activate effect. Now, the cost for activating this effect, the thing you have to do no matter what, even if your effect doesn't resolve, mm -hmm. even if your opponent negates it, no matter what, you have to fulfill the cost of this effect, which here is to reveal a Sword Soul card or worm monster in your hand. So your opponent doesn't have to decide whether or not they want to respond until, until after you've fulfilled the until after you've paid the cost. Correct. In this case, revealing the monster. Um, other costs can be anything from... Sending a card from your deck to the graveyard in the or, case of yeah. Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardish. Yeah, or in the case of Long Wan, discarding a card from your hand. Correct. Those are great examples. Or Sword Soul of Taya says you can banish a Sword Soul card or War Monster from your graveyard, semicolon. Um, now, sometimes the, the, co the cost is to just target something. Right. In which So basically, if it was, say, when this card is normal summon, colon... Target one on, one card on the field, semicolon, blah 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 blah. So you would normal summon it, declare activation of effect, and then declare who you're targeting, and then your opponent decides whether or not to respond. Sword Soul Grandmaster Chi Zhao. The cost is to banish a Sword Soul card or worm from your graveyard, and target a monster your opponent controls. That's all cost for for Sword Soul Grandmaster Chi Zhao. Yes. So you have to do all of that. Banish the card. And then declare who your target is on the field. Right. And then your opponent gets, gets the opportunity to respond. Yes. And then should they have no response, the effect resolves and the monster gets negated. Right. So that's the important things to note when it comes to a colon versus a semicolon. Like just to one more time, everything before a colon is activation condition. These are the requirements that must be fulfilled for this effect to activate at all. Bef everything before the semicolon is cost. So these the cost must be paid before you can resolve this effect. So you activate the effect, you pay the cost, and then you resolve the effect pending your opponent's response. Of course. So that gives us through activation and costs and I think before we go any farther, now would be a great time to take just a just a minute to talk about another sponsor, ETB Games. So a huge shout out to ETB Games in Alexandria, Louisiana. They are, of course, a sponsor of the podcast. They are a wonderful one-stop shop to get everything that you need for the card games that you love. You can get singles and sealed product, as well as play mats. You can get deck boxes, binders, everything that you need for all of the card games that you love, like Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Digimon, etc. They also have figurines and the paint for the figurines, as well as pre-painted. 
they have dice they have big tabletop mats they have the guy strategy guidebooks and everything like that for all the tabletop games that you love they also have a wonderful space to go hang out and play some video games so if you are interested in doing in coming to etb they are located on MacArthur drive in alexandria louisiana be sure of course to check them out and if you want to attend the etb battle city tournament day that will be held on june the 25th of this month it's an edison tournament isn't it yes this etb battle city day will be edison format so if you're interested please be sure to check it out if you need exact address and details if you can't find on google maps for whatever reason yeah. message us on discord we got you oh yeah uh we're actually planning on going to that yeah we'll be there so be sure to come on and check it out all right Let's get back on into some of these cards and effects, and let's talk about mandatory versus optional effects. So most effects that happen in the Yu-Gi-Oh card game are actually optional. There's a sh kind of smallish amount that are mandatory effects, but most of the effects actually you don't have to do them. So the main way that you can distinguish between an optional effect and a mandatory effect is whether or not the card says you can. So a good example of a mandatory effect is Artifact Scythe. Artifact Scythe says, when this card <clears throat> special summoned to your field during your opponent's turn, your opponent cannot special summon monsters from their extra deck for the rest of this turn. Notice that at no point does it say can. Right. So... Versus something like Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, the other part of the famous Scythe Lock. Yeah, which is no longer a thing. <laughs> eh, technically it is, but it's just not a, it's not very consistent anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer says, when this card is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon a Destiny Hero monster. Or yes, hero Destiny Hero monster. You can you can special summon a Destiny Hero monster from your graveyard during your next standby phase. So this is an optional effect that you don't have to trigger. So it's important to know why some effects are mandatory and versus optional. So another thing to note is when you're structuring a chain link, if multiple effects trigger at the same time, then you as turn player get to prioritize those chain links how you want mm -hmm. but mandatory effects must go in the chain first correct that is correct yeah yes that is correct mandatories okay. must go first but if you have multiple mandatories firing off you can at that point you can arrange however you want um so that's actually called seagog simultaneous effects go on chain right so seagog is pretty important in Yu-Gi-Oh. yeah so the way it works is that it's turn players Mandatory effects, they arrange them however they want. Uh, opponents, mandatory effects, however they want. Then, pl turn players, optional uh, effects, however they want. Turn play, uh, opponents, opponents, optional effects, however they want. Right. So, it gives you the opportunity as turn player to structure your effects in a way to where it makes it more difficult for your opponent to respond. A that, good a good op, a good example of this would be if I use Sword Soul of Mo Yi to synchro summon into Sword Soul Grandmaster Chi Shao, I can activate both Chi Shao and Mo Yi both right here, which are both optional effects. Right. They're optional trigger effects. So Sword Soul of Mo Yi says if this card is used as synchro material for the synchro summon of I think it's actually just if this card is sent to the graveyard as synchro material. It might be. You can, you can draw one card. And Sword Soul Grandmaster Chi Shao says, uh, let's see. When this card is synchro summoned. Yeah, if this card is synchro summoned, you can add to your hand or banish one Sword Soul card from your deck. So typically you can go chain link one Chi Shao, chain link two Sword Soul of Mo Yi. So this makes it to where if your opponent has an Ash Blossom and Joy Spring in hand, they can only Ash the uh, Mo Yi. Right, so their Ash can only respond to the Mo Yi because that, that was the last thing to happen. That's called chain blocking. Right, and it's a very, very important thing to understand when you're playing Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh yeah, but, oh yeah, oh, so that way you don't attempt to use an Ash on a chain where you can't. 
Uh, a good example of that is uh, Chainlink 1, uh, Soul Eating Oviraptor, Chainlink 2, Lost World. Right. You cannot Ash Lost World, therefore in that chain you cannot activate Ash. Right. That's a great example. So, then if you look at the first part, so we looked at you can versus it just saying the effect. There's another part to really think about there. So, Sword Soul of Mo, or how about this? I'll do Sword Soul Grandmaster T Show. It says, if this card is synchro summoned. The if is the important bit there. Right. Whereas if we look at a card like Yazi Evil of the Yang Zing, it says, when this card you control is destroyed by battle or card effect and sent to your graveyard, you can special summon a worm type monster from your deck in defense position. So, if a card says when, that, if the card says when can, when blank happens you can blank that means that the triggering effect has to has to have been the last thing to occur yeah chain link one the very last thing to occur a great example is activate effect of yazi to pop himself and a monster your opponent controls yeah normally that would resolve the last thing to happen was yazi popping himself because that effect will activate but let's say activate Yazi because his effect is uh, destroy one crawl on your field and your opponent's field. Non-targeting, correct? It, it does target. Okay. You can target one Yang Z monster you control and one card your opponent controls. Destroy them. Okay, cool. Uh, so if you Ghost Ogre the Yazi, Chain Link 2, Ghost Ogre destroys Yazi. Chain Link 1, Yazi, Yazi's effect resolves. Destroying the card on your opponent's field. Yes. Um, we'll get into why it still resolves anyway in a minute. Um, so in that situation, the thing that popped the Yazi was not Chainlink One. Therefore, Yazi cannot activate his effect, and he, and I'm this is in quotation in uh, quotation marks, misses the timing. Yeah, missing the timing is a really like scary term to most to most Yu-Gi-Oh players. But the the thing that the way a card can miss timing is. It can only miss timing if it has a when can effect. So when this happens, you can. If it says when this ha uh, if this happens, you can. Can't miss timing. Correct. Or if it just says when this happens, Blank. do this. Right. That's a mandatory effect and so, will activate regardless. Something along the lines of Mirror Force, actually. When your opponent's monster declares attack, destroy all monsters your opponent controls. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so that it, yeah it, that that's. Yeah, that is correct. I was trying to say that it's more like that for a reason. I was like, well, it's a trap card. Yeah. The point is, only cards that say when and can are capable of missing timing. And even then, it's not always easy to make them miss timing. Oh, yeah. There's a lot There's a lot of when can effects that are... uh, Like, when your opponent activates a card effect, do this. A great example of that is actually... Artifact Dagda, who I don't have a copy of me on, but he's a win. He's a win uh, triggering quick effect. Right. Which means that. Okay, so like let's say I activate Double Evolution Pill. Right. With a Dagda on board again, going with the Dino. Uh, this because I'm playing right now, so it's in my head. Uh, let's say Sunny activates Ash and Ashes the Double Evo Pill. The last thing that happened in that chain at that point was not a card on the field's effect activating. Therefore, Dagda can't trigger. Right. And you still have... And you can't just go Chain Link 1... Uh, double Evo Pill. Double Evo Pill, Chain Link 2. Dagda, you have to give your opponent the opportunity to respond. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. But know that... Basically, what missing the timing means is... It means that the card that is missing the timing basically it did not have the opportunity to activate its optional effect because its condition for activation was not the most recent thing that happened yeah so it cannot happen when that happened yeah yeah so again the only time you really have to worry about that is if the card says when blank happens do blank you can yeah you can blank right yeah all right the next thing you're talking about is targeting targeting is it's pretty self-explanatory yeah um basically if a card targets it will very specifically state on the card that it targets um we're just stating this mostly for completionist's sake yeah. um 
So, like, a great example of this is... So, uh, Sword Grandmaster Master Shop targets. Yes. It How says you can target one monster in your opponent's field and negate that monster's effects. However, DP does not target. Right. Destiny Hero, Destroyer, Phoenix, Enforcer says you can destroy one card you control and one card your opponent controls. Yes. So, it does not target. So, you don't select what gets popped until DP is resolving. Right. Whereas if you have to target, then, well, you have to declare who your targets are. And if they if something happens to them where they're no longer valid targets, depending upon how the card's worded, either you don't get that effect or that if uh, you don't just don't get that effect at all, or you get only part of the effect. Again, it, that that's on a case by case basis. Yeah. Something to note about that particular is something like Forbidden Droplet. It says choose, not target. Therefore, it does not target. Right. It, so, yeah. All right. Next thing we're going to cover is once per turns. Believe it or not, there's about six different kinds of once per effects. Yeah. Now, keep in mind that a lot of these are fan terms to, to shortcut saying you can only activate this effect once per turn as opposed to you can only activate the effect of this card once per turn. Right. So... Just to real quick say, what we have here is cards that are not once per turn at all. So they don't say once per turn anywhere on the card. You have a soft once per turn, a hard once per turn, what we're calling a super hard once per turn, once while face up on the field, once per dual effects. So let's start with not once per turn at all. Yeah. These are pretty simple. This is a card that it has its effect and it's you can do it whenever you want. It, it's Ooh. just, you can do it over and over and over and over. And it doesn't say once per turn anywhere on the card. I have a great old, old example for that. I'm here for it. Cannon Soldier. That That is that is a wonderful example, yeah. So Cannon Soldier reads, uh, you contribute one monster you control, deal 800, deal some, I don't remember how much effect damage, deal some effect damage. It's 500. Deal some effect damage. Yeah. It does not say once per turn. So as long as you have monsters on field, you can just keep activating that effect. So let's so let's say you got a bunch of frogs on field and and like a bunch of frogs and grave and rodent totems. You can tribute rodent totem, burn, tribute, burn, tribute, burn, effect to revive the rodent totems, tribute, burn, tribute, burn, tribute, burn, effect to revive right, the rodent right. totems. Exactly, yeah, etc. Another great example of a really meta relevant card that does not say once per turn anywhere on it is Fairy Tale Snow. So Fairy Tale Snow reads. If this card is normal or special summoned, you can target one face-up monster your opponent controls, change it to face-down defense position. During either player's turn, if this card is in your graveyard, you can banish seven other cards from your hand, field, and or graveyard special summon this card. So, it doesn't say once per that turn. That part's a quick effect, right? Well, it says during either player's turn. So, so. yes, yeah, that would be a quick effect. In Essentially. This case. It, it's a pre-quick effect. Right. It, during either player's turn, if this card is in your graveyard. So essentially what that means is for the like the revival effect, you can activate effect, banish seven. Your opponent gets the opportunity to respond. Let's say they activate DD Crow targeting it. You can chain if, snow to DD Crow. If you have enough materials in grave to banish, you can go activate effect of snow hand again. Field, hand field or grave. Yeah, hand field, yeah, then banish more cards and get it anyway. Right. Yeah, um Fairy Tale Snow is crazy. That yeah. card should be banned. <laughs> and then, like something else you can do is if you again having the materials to do so. You could like link it off, right? Yep. And then, uh, so you can like, so you can like normal summon, activate its effect, flip, flip, flip a card, link it off, revive it, flip a card again because it was summoned again properly, right? And then link it off again, and then revive it again, and then do it again. Yes. Because uh, nothing is once per turn on that card. And typically, um, some of the most broken cards in the game's history are not once per turn, or they're a soft once per turn. Mm -hmm. So, a soft once per turn is, it says once per turn and then has the effect. So, I know that that says, oh, that means it's once per turn, but what this means is it's once per turn. For that instance. Right. For that particular copy of that card. But, notably, if it leaves the field or... And if, then comes back. Or whatever. It's a different card. Um... A great example of that, actually, is uh, Baby Ceratosaurus. Well, it's not no, a once per turn. No. Toy Vendor. Toy Vendor. There you go. All yeah. right. So Toy Vendor says, once per turn, colon, you can discard one card, semicolon, draw one card and show it. Then if it is a fluffle monster, you can special summon it 
special summon one monster from your hand. Otherwise, discard the card you drew. And then it says, if this card is sent to the graveyard, you can add one Edge of Savers or one Fluffle of Monster from your deck to your hand. Okay, so lots to unpack there. The, the only the important bit is that first line. Once per turn, discard one card, etc. Right. etc. That means that if you have three copies, you can do it three times. Correct. But if you have one copy, send it to the graveyard, and in the same t activate its effect, let's say you then pop it with a card effect, get it back to your hand, reactivate it, you can activate its again, effect again, because that's a different... As far as the game mechanics are concerned, that's a different toy vendor than was activated before. Correct. It's a different instance of that card. Yes. So, soft once returns. Another one is Zodiac Chakanine. Yes. So, Zodiac Chakanine says that... Once per turn, you can detach an Xyz material from this card, target one Zodiac monster in your graveyard, and special summon it. So, here's an example of a Zodiac combo line that they would go to to go into oh, uh, Infinite Track Fortress Mega Clops. You can normal summon Zodiac right here, activate effect, send Zodiac Ram Ram from your deck to the graveyard. Then you use Rat Pierre as material to make Zodiac Chakanine. Activate Chakanine's effect to summon Zodiac Ram Ram. So, You've used up the once per turn of this Chalkanine, right? But then you overlay Dryden over Chalkanine, activate Dryden, detaching Chalkanine to destroy Ram Ram. So what happens here is Ram Ram's effect triggers and special summons the Chalkanine back. Now the game, as far as, it's con as far as the game is concerned, this is a new copy of this card. It's a new instance of this card. So you can activate that effect again. Right. So you can go Tiger Mortar on top of Dryden Effective Tiger Mortar, detach Dryden to attach Ram Ram to Chalkanine's material. Then you detach from Chalkanine to summon Dryden back. And now you have three Xyz monsters on your board and you can make Infinite Track Fortress Mega Clops. Mm -hmm. Or you can, now that you have it, you can you don't even have to activate it. You can just go into Utopic Draco Future. But yeah, yeah. the point is, it gives you the ability to recycle and reuse these effects multiple times off of one card. That's why soft once returns and not once return effects are so feared and revered throughout the game's history. Oh yeah. You also have some effects that say once per chain. So this is like Opelousa Bow of the Goddess. Yeah. This You can only activate this effect once per chain. Um, so a great example of an instance where that matters is with Appaloosa. Like let's say... My opponent activates a card effect. I activate Appaloosa. They activate another monster effect. Ghost Ogre. Ghost Ogre. I cannot activate Appalo that, Appa that Appaloosa. Again in the chain. Again in that chain. Now if I have a second Appaloosa, I can activate that one. Because that's a different one. But what are the odds of anyone ever having... Multiple Appaloosas. On board. I don't know if that even... Anyway, that's not the point. Yeah, that's not the point. The point is, once per chain, it has... Uh, fun f don't fact check us on that. We don't know that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like nine. <laughs> I don't have in front of me. Yeah, I'm not. I'm like nine nine percent sure. I'm reading it now. Uh, I guess that is how that would work. I guess I've just never considered it. Yeah, it is because it does because it doesn't say like it, there's no indicator that it's Appaloosa the bow right. the goddess. It's just once per chain you can make this this card loses the counter attack. Next we have hard once per turn. See, that's a good example of reading a card to try and figure out how its effect would work. Right. That's why this is important. So, hard once per turn say you can only activate or use the effect of this card once per turn. Ash Blossom and Joy Spring is a hard once per turn because you can only activate or use this effect of Ash Blossom and Joy Spring once per turn. So that means that you can only activate or use the effect of any card with this card's name once per turn. We'll get into the why we're saying activate or use. That's actually very important. Right. Uh, another example where a card has multiple effects that are like once per turn mm -hmm. is Soul Eating Over Raptor. Because on normal summon, search, that can also pop to revive. At the very end, you can only use each effect of Soul Eating Over Raptor once per turn. Which means that even if I like pop this one and then bring it back and then if I've already activated the, either one of those effects, I cannot activate them. Right. So next we have what we're calling a super hard once per turn. This reads, you can only activate or use one of this card's effects once per turn and only once that turn. So a good example is Heavenly Dragon Circle. It has two effects. One where you tribute a worm to add one from your deck to your hand. Or if it's in your graveyard, then during the main phase, if you control a face-up non-effect monster, you can banish it from your graveyard to add a 10 card from your deck to your hand. But then at the end, 
you can only use one Heavenly Dragon Circle effect per turn and only once that turn. So essentially, it means that it has multiple effects, but you can only use one of them per turn. Mm -hmm. Sword Soul Grandmaster Chi Shao is the same way. Oh yeah, there, there's a lot of cards, but these cards, but, but the whole super hard once per turn is very indic one hearts per uh, one hard super hard once per turn. Tongue twister there uh, <laughs> is the fact that it has multiple effects, but you can only get one of them at a time. Right. So usually this is limited for very powerful cards that have very powerful effects. Next, we have the once while face up on the field. So this is not something that comes up very often, but it does happen. The so, most notable one is Baron de Fleur. Yeah, so Baron de Fleur says it has its Omni Negate effect, and it says you can only use this effect of this card once while this card is face up on the field. And then, just for good measure, it says you can only use the previous effect once per turn. So it's once while face up on the field and once per turn. It's a hard once per turn on that, isn't it? Yes. So, okay, so, so ignoring the fact that it's a hard once per turn real quick, that means that, let's say, let's say it's... You've already summoned it for a turn. It's come back to you. You activate the negate, and then you book a moon, and then flip summon it. Yes. It would. You would then get that. You'd then be able to get that effect again. All How, right. But because it does say you can only use the effect this effect once per turn, blah blah blah, wouldn't work. Right. Next, you have once per duel effects. So this is things like glow up bulb or spore. You can only activate or use this effect once per duel. It's pretty self-explanatory, but yeah. we figured it was worth mentioning. So. Next, we're going to talk about the difference between activate versus use. So this mainly only comes up if a card is being negated. So if you look at a card like Lightning Storm, Lightning Storm says you can only use this effect of Lightning Storm once per turn. But because it says use and not act or no, it says you can only activate this effect of Lightning Storm once per turn. Yes. So because it says you can only activate once per turn instead of use, if that means if yeah. you're yeah, if your opponent negates it with something like bear on the fleur, specifically negates the activation. Correct. That's the key thing you want to look for. Yes. So if your opponent negates the activation, it allows you to use that again. A great way to think about this is use is an umbrella term. If you're using the effect of a card, then it applies for everything. So something like Ash Blossom and Joy Spring says you can only use this effect of Ash Blossom and Joy Spring once per turn. Whereas, like I said, so even if that Ash Blossom gets negated, you still cannot try attempt to activate Ash Blossom again because we've already used that effect. But if you have two Lightning Storms, you activate one, your opponent negates it, you can just kind of negate that activation and go, cool, Lightning Storm? I've had it happen to me. Just slap down the second one. Yes. So it gives you a way to play still even if your effect gets negated or if the activation gets negated. Something that's very critical is if there's a big difference between negating the effect and negating the activation. So something like Ash Blossom and Joy Spring negates effects, not activations. So a good example of this in the meta would be branded and lost and branded few or branded lost and branded fusion versus ash blossom so if you have a card that negates activations and your opponent says activate branded lost and then you don't respond and then they activate branded fusion well you can't negate the activation of branded fusion because of the effect of branded and lost whereas if you have an ash blossom joy spring you're not negating the activation you're just negating the effect so that's kind of part of the reason that there is a notable difference between negating the activation and negating the effect. And also, if you can, if you can only activate or if you can only use an effect once per turn. Mm -hmm. So, the last thing that we're going to cover here is the conjunctions. So there's... Oh boy. Yeah. There's five conjunctions in Yu-Gi-Oh! When you're reading effects. There's then, also... <laughs> And if you do, also after that, an and. So, then says, do A, then do B. So, A is required for B to happen, but not the other way around. So, a good example of this is branded in red. It makes you target a monster in your graveyard, then add it to your hand and perform a fusion summon. 
So you have to be able to fulfill A to do B. Next, if you look at and, it says do and do A and B. A and B is happening simultaneously. If you cannot do both, then nothing happens. So an example of this is Destroy a Phoenix Enforcer. It says destroy one card you control and one card your opponent controls. Uh, it's one card you control, one card on the field. Oh, I'm sorry, one card on the field. So, essentially, if you cannot destroy one card you control, so say Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer is the only card on your field, you activate your effect, and your opponent chains Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit, destroying your Phoenix Enforcer, then you cannot properly resolve the effect because you can't do both. You cannot destroy a card on your field because you have no cards on your field. Yep. Next you have, and if you do... So this says, do A, and if you do, do B. A and B happen simultaneously. A is required for B, but not vice versa. So a good example of this is Baxia, Brightness of the Yang Zane. Baxia says, you can target one card you control and one level four lower monster in your graveyard, colon. Destroy that card on the field. And if you do, special summon that other monster from the graveyard. So... Essentially, if you cannot destroy the monster on your field for whatever reason... Your opponent activates something to make it immune to destruction by card effects. Or, even better, I have a set card in my back row, and my opponent chains where I can't keep break. Yeah. So, I use Baxia, I target, my, I target a card on my field, and I monster my graveyard. And then, I think this is where the not vice versa happens right mm -hmm. so if my opponent regeki breaks the card on my field baxia can't destroy it so it can't summon back from the graveyard because it says and if you do if you are successful in right but the difference between this versus then or and is if my opponent activates call by the grave and banishes my target i still destroy that card on my field but then I don't get to special summon anything because it says, and if you do. So you still fulfill A, but you can't fulfill B. So you and just fulfill you, you fulfill the effect as much as possible. Yes. All right. Then you have also. Do A, also do B. Now, A and B happen simultaneously, and neither is required for the other to occur. So a good example of this would be Tenyi Spirit Ashuna. So Tenyi Spirit Ashuna says you can banish this card from your hand or graveyard special summon one tenny monster from your deck except tenny spirit ashina also you cannot special summon monsters for the rest of this turn except worms so that means that if you banish tenny spirit ashina and then for whatever reason you cannot special summon a worm from your deck you're still worm locked correct uh, let's say your opponent, in response, activates Tikaboo, and you already have a worm on field. Right. You still get worm blocked. Correct. Great example. Next, you have also after that. <clears throat> B happens after A in sequence. Neither is required for the other to occur. So, a good example would be Pot of Duality. Pot of Duality has its effect where you excavate three cards from the top of your deck. It says... You add one of those to your hand. Also, after that, you cannot special summon monsters for the rest of this turn. So that means that if for whatever reason your opponent does something to where you cannot fulfill the first part of the activation of this card, you still cannot special summon for the rest of this turn. Yeah, I can't think of any reason why for that. That's why I added a second example here with the Rise of the Mega Monarch. Right. Um, but it's also after that effect where is. Uh, relying on it being tribute summoned and using a wing of beast right which is to send another, the other one uh, an extra card yeah and the last thing that we were going to touch on is conditions conditions are really weird they're not really continuous effects it's just a continuous effect is basically just a rule of that particular card a good example would be phantom knight's rusty bardiche the very last line of its text cannot be used for a link summon Correct. That is a condition. If your opponent imperms the Rusty Bardiche, you still cannot use it as link as link material. And there's no really great way to tell if this if there's if this effect is a condition. You just kind of have to know. 
Yeah, um, a lot of the times it is something along those lines of this card cannot be used as link material. This cards mm -hmm. can this card cannot be used for blank. Right. This card can only be special summoned by blank. Yes. Uh, something along or this this yeah so stuff like that where it's obviously a negative thing that like that's something I've noticed that a lot of conditions are are negative toward that card and are kind of a limiter on that card. And it's done that way on purpose. Yeah. Uh, another one is one of the Albaz fusions cannot be used as fusion material. Same thing with, I think it was a Chimera Tech Forger's Dragon, something like that. Yeah, same thing. Um, yeah, so like I said, the big thing is uh, a lot of these, you're going to kind of have to just look it up online. Right. I hate to say that, but it's true. Because uh, a lot, because there's no, there's no good problem solving card text indicator. Yeah. Um, so rule of thumb is if it's a negative thing, it's probably uh, applied to the card that keeps the card from being used for something. It's probably a condition. When in doubt, look it up. Another great example of a condition would be there's naming conditions like a legendary ocean. This card is always treated as Umi, which means that if you have three cards, legendary ocean, you can't use Umi because it legendary ocean is also Umi. Right. Even while in deck building. Correct. So it's a rule of the card. Always, 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 even in that, deck building. Now, that is actually very specifically always denoted in parenthesis right underneath where it says like the cards type. Right. Um, Because that's all the same thing with Cyber Harpy Lady, Harpy Lady 1, Harpy Lady 2, and Harpy Lady 3 with Harpy Lady. The, right. Underneath where it says Winged Beast Effect, it says in parenthesis, this card is always treated as Harpy Lady. Correct. So... I hope that we shed a little bit of light on kind of how to read Yu-Gi-Oh cards. I, I know that reading your Yu-Gi-Oh cards is something that's not necessarily intuitive always. It sounds easy. I oh, just read the cards, but there's a lot of text on those cards and a lot of very specific text. That's borderline lawyer speak sometimes. Yes. Have you read Nirvana High Paladin? Yeah, exactly. So please be sure to read these cards. I, I know that there was a lot of information packed very tightly into this episode. Hey, you know, I won't, I won't stop if you want to listen again. But if you have any questions or concerns, hit us up in our Discord. We'll be happy to ask. We'll be happy to answer your questions, I mean. Yeah, you can always hit us up on Twitter and the Discord <coughs> server. We'll answer as best as we can. Or also... Ask your local judge at your locals. It, most of the time to get certified as a Konami judge, you really need to know <clears throat> at least most of these effects, conditions, conjunctions. You need to have a pretty general understanding of it. And worst come to worst, say you don't really have a locals that you go to. You don't really want to just put yourself out there and just start asking people. That's fine. I understand that. Google is your best friend. Um, if you don't know what to Google, uh, a very important keyword is ruling. Or PSCT, problem solving card text. Yes. If you type in PSCT in Google and that's all you type in, it'll actually bring up the Yugipedia page for problem solving card text where we got mm -hmm. a lot of our information from. Mm -hmm. So that way you can kind of take yourself step by step through each individual piece. Right. So... It's very, very helpful to know all of these individual things. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a complicated card game. And knowing how these cards work and knowing the way that these cards interact with each other can sometimes be the thing that puts you ahead of your opponent. It can really give you that edge in a tournament environment. Just knowing how your cards work, knowing how your cards interact with each other, and knowing how to read a card and understand what a card is doing on the fly so understanding these things in a quick manner and being able to just read the card and understand the potential applications and usages can help you out in say a tournament a lot by just being able to look at it and tell oh well this isn't once per turn so there's no reason for me to negate this right now yeah or um, you have to declare, oh, you have to declare your target or, oh, the discard, the discard on this isn't cost. It's, it's part of the card effect. So I don't have to discard anything. 
Correct. until after my opponent responds. Right. It's very important to understand all these different little intricacies. So, like I said, if you have questions, hit us up or hit up a, your local judge or do a little bit of research on the problem solving card text in the game. But that's going to wrap it up for today's episode. Thank you for sticking it out if you're still here. And let's go ahead and do the podcast question of the day. So the last podcast question of the day was, what do you think is the best deck in the current format? We had some great answers. Heroes, Pendulums, Dragon Links, Adam Emancipator. Okay, a lot of cope, a lot of cope. I understand. <laughs> um, we had some Despia answers. S- several people said Despia. Adventure Punk, that's a great answer. We did have a that's couple a of- cool s- answer. Yep, yeah, we did have a couple of Sword Soul answers, so. Um, today's podcast question of the day is what is something about problem solving card text that confuses you? So I would love to get some of your answers so that maybe we can potentially answer some of these on the next episode and hopefully help some people out. Uh, almost kind, almost kind of do a part two. Yeah. It's kind of a Q and a. Yeah, yeah, where it's like, well, based on your, well, based on what you just told me, I don't understand this part. Can you clarify this? Right. So thank you all again so much for listening to today's episode. Of course, be sure to check out our Discord in the description down below and our Patreon as well. Be sure to check out our Twitter page at Top Cut Podcast. And of course, check out those affiliate links in the description down below for both Dragon Shield and TCG Player. Go ahead, click on it, and just shopping like you normally would. Costs you nothing extra to support the channel and support the show. We really do appreciate it. And until next time, have a great weekend, everybody. Take care, everybody.